31, we're going to do the same thing that we did in example 2, but our equation is worse. All right, our equation is nowhere near standard form. Our center will no longer be at the origin, so it's going to make all of our traits just a little bit more complicated. And your first thing that you have to do is you have to get this equation into standard form because it's in standard form where you can read a, b, and c, or at least you can read a squared and b squared, get to c squared, and you can also see your center. I can't see the center here, just looking at it, I don't know what the center is, and I don't know what a or b is. So we need to move this into standard form. And in order to do that, you're gonna have to complete the square. Now completing the square was one of those, those techniques we had for solving quadratic equations, it was one of the techniques that always worked if you wanted to complete the square to solve a quadratic equation, but it was probably, at least for me, my least favorite method to use. And the only time I really complete a square is in cases like this, when I need to complete the square to get a, an equation from whatever you want to call this, this is not standard form, but to get this ellipse into standard form. So let's review up completing a square. All right, get this equation into standard form and then let's start picking off all of these traits. So I'm gonna copy this equation just in this, this space below the graph. You can't quite see it yet, so I can work through this. So I'm gonna scooch this up so that I have all the room I can get to get this equation into standard form because it it's gonna take us a good chunk of time. It's not a quick process. So let me start by rewriting this. So I'm looking at 9x squared plus 72x, and you're gonna see me put a little space, I'm gonna put plus 16y squared, plus 32y, and I'm actually gonna move the constant over to the other side. All right, so when it comes to completing a square, this is your, your starting point. Get all the, the terms with x clumped together, get all the terms with y clumped together, and get any constant moved to the other side of the equation. So I had two terms with x's in them, two terms with y's in them, and then I had that constant of plus 16, so I just moved it over to the other side of the equation. All right, now in order for this technique of completing the square to work, you have to have a lead coefficient of one in front of your squared terms. And right now, I have a lead coefficient of nine and a lead coefficient of 16 for the x squared and y squared terms, respectively. It's not gonna work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out the GCF here. So I'm going to take out a 9, and I'm going to get x squared plus 8x. All right, I'm going to take out a 16. I'll get y squared plus 2y. Now you notice that I'm still saving some space, or leaving some space. And because I ultimately want to complete a square, I'm going to leave some space. All right, now just so that I, I have all of my steps written out, I'm going to rewrite this exactly as is again, but we'll add to it. All right. Okay, so how does completing the square work? Well, as long as your lead coefficient is one, which for right now it is because I have this nine factored out, you take half of the linear term or half of the coefficient in front of the linear term and square it. So go with me. What is half of eight? It, or I should say half of positive eight is positive four, right? So I, I usually just put a little note here. Half of positive eight is positive four. What is positive four squared? 16, okay? Now, when you add 16 to one side of the equation, you need to balance it and add 16 to the other side of the equation. But be careful, you didn't really add just 16. Don't forget that this 16 is gonna get multiplied by nine. So to balance out my equation, let's see what 16 times nine is equal to. It looks like 144. What I really need to do is add 144 to this side of the equation, okay? Now, I've got that happening, right? I've completed the square here, and we'll talk about how that simplifies. But try and get ahead of me. Imagine what number I'm about to add here. So again, the process is always take half of the coefficient in front of the linear term and square it. So half of this number, square it. Well, what is half of positive two? Positive one. What is positive one squared? Positive one. And typically we would say, well, if I added one to the left side of the equation, I need to add one to the right side of the equation. And that's true, but you didn't really just add one, you added one times 16, so I'm actually gonna add 16 to that side of the equation. 
okay? So just keeping all of that in mind, right? Half of the linear term or half of the coefficient for the linear term squared, whatever you added to one side, balance it out by adding to the other. And be careful, if you have factored out a GCF, don't forget to multiply these two numbers together. All right, so what that means is this is now a complete square in terms of it's a binomial squared, and it's technically x plus four. That's why I always write those little plus fours here. This would be 16 times y plus one squared. Now, negative 16 plus 16 is zero, and zero plus 144 is 144. All right, so I'm getting closer to being in standard form. Now the problem with, with what I have so far is that I don't have a one on the right side of the equation. So again, I'm gonna rewrite this so that I'm not skipping any steps. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide every term by 144. All right, and if we take a look at nine over 144, it looks like that's the number 1 16th, so I'm going to ultimately have x plus 4 squared over 16. All right, I'm going to have y plus 1 squared. Let's see what 16 over 144 reduces to. It reduces to 1 9th, okay, so that means I'll have a 9 in the denominator. I would technically have a 1 here, but I don't need to write that, and that's equal to 1. Okay. So now I actually do have my ellipse in standard form, but let's start picking apart some important um, traits here and some important letters. So first of all, you can start to see I'm no longer centered at the origin. My center now is negative four, negative one. All right, so I'm just gonna take note of important things right here. I can see my center is negative four, negative one, I need to find a, b, and c. Well, a squared is 16, b squared is nine, so from here I see a is equal to four, b is equal to three, right? And we also know that c squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. So if I take that into effect, c squared or into account, c squared is equal to a squared minus b squared. Let me move this up, just so we can see all of that work. I told you this is a long process. All right, we've got a squared, which is what, 16? Minus nine, that's seven. So now I'm getting that c is equal to the square root of seven. All right, so there's a, b, c, and there's my center. All right, and that's what I'm gonna need to finish off my graph. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna keep this in mind. Now, a is four and it was under the x-axis, so that means my major axis is horizontal. I just wanna, I wanna keep that in mind. My major axis is horizontal, my minor axis is vertical. Okay, so here we go, negative four, negative one. I'm gonna scooch this back down and we're gonna start to graph this out. All right, so let me get that, there we go. All right, so negative four, actually let me move this down just a little bit more so we can see everything. Okay, so my, my center, oops, let me go ahead and label and scale my axes. All right, so we have negative four, one, two, three, four, negative one. So there's my center. All right, and just so that we have the notes here, we knew A was four, B was three and C was the square root of seven. All right, here we go. A was four, and this was associated with the X variable. So if A is four, I'm gonna move left and right four units from the center. So if I move four units left, I'm gonna go one, two, three, four. If I move four units right, one, two, three, four. There are my vertices. Now, if I'm moving left and right from the center, is that going to affect my x-coordinate or my y-coordinate? Well, left-right motion affects your x-coordinate. So if I want to find my vertices, add and subtract a to the x-coordinate. So negative 4 minus 4 is negative 8, negative 1. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0, negative 1. And those are my ordered pairs. You can see it here, right? Negative 8, negative 1, 0, negative 1. 
and take a look. They're all the same units below. They're all one unit below the x-axis, right? They have the same y variable because they're all one unit below, right? One unit below, one unit below, one unit below. All right, so we got that. Now the covertices, they deal with B, right? So the vertices, we're going A units from the center, covertices, B units from the center. So I need to go three units from the center, but B was associated with the Y variable, so that's gonna move me up and down three. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, now if I'm moving up and down from the center, if you move up and down, does that affect your X coordinate or your Y coordinate? Well, it affects your y coordinate. So let's do this. So my x coordinate will stay the same. All right, we're going to go to b. Negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. All right, and then I have negative 4 again. And negative 1 plus 3 is 2. And let's see, does that work? Negative, this is the point ordered pair negative 4, 2. This is negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. OK, so that's working. And I can graph this now. All right, so we've moved A units from the center along the major axis, B units from the center along the minor axis. Now we're gonna move C units from the center along the major axis. So now the square root of seven, if I wanted to think about the square root of seven as a number, it's about 2.6, okay. So I want you to imagine from the center, you're gonna move right 2.6 units, so one 2.6 units. And then I'm going to move left, 1, 2.6 units. There are my foci. They are C units away from the center along the major axis. OK, if you're moving left and right from the center, will that affect your x coordinate or your y coordinate? Well, left, right affects your x coordinate. So for my foci, I'm going to be at negative 4 minus root 7, comma negative 1. And then I'm going to be at negative 4 plus root 7, comma negative 1. And a lot of times you'll see people write the foci up. They'll just say negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 7, negative 1. I don't care which way you write it up. If it makes more sense in your head to give me the two foci separately listed, great. If you want to combine them, great. All right, so with that, we're getting closer to the end of this, right? It's always the trickiest to get all of these ordered pairs, right? The vertices, the covertices, and the foci. All right, the next thing that we're being asked to find, let me move this up now. All right, now I wanna find the length of the major axis and the length of the minor axis. Okay, well, the length of the major axis is always two A units long. A in this case, if we've got it, oh, I don't quite have it in view, but A was 4. So this is always 2 A units long. So the length of the major axis is 8 units long. The length of the minor axis is always 2 B units long, so that's 6. When I talk about the endpoints of the major axis, well, that's just another vocab term for the vertices. If this is the major axis here, this is an endpoint, that vertice, and that vertice. So the Endpoints of the major axis are negative 8, negative 1, and 0, negative 1. Right? Same as the vertices, every time out. All right? And then I could also ask you for the endpoints of the minor axis. Well, the endpoints of the minor axis are just the covertices. Oops, you can't quite see all of them. I'll scooch this back down just for a moment. But the endpoints of the minor axes are the same as the covertices. So negative 4, negative 4, and negative 4, 2. All right, let me move this up. All right, so we've got endpoints of the minor axis at negative four, negative four, and then negative four, two. All right, so again, endpoints of the major axis, same as the vertices. Endpoints of the minor axis, same as the covertices. So let's write same as vertices. And here, this is the same as your co-vertices. Just a different vocab term. All right. I'm going to scooch back down to get the graph in view. But keep in mind, we're going to look for domain and range. Those are our final two traits. So let's go back up here All right, and see if we can find 
our, our last two traits, our domain and range. All right, so if I think about my domain for this function, it's left to right. Well, my leftmost point was over here at negative eight, right? and my rightmost point was over here at zero. At least that was their x-coordinates, negative eight to zero. And you can see from my range, my lowest point was at negative four, and my highest point was at positive two. So I'm taking the x-coordinates of my vertices and the y-coordinates of my co-vertices. So let me move this all the way back down. There's so many traits on these. All right, so our domain here is going to be from negative 8 to 0, inclusive. And then our range is going to be from negative 4 to 2, also inclusive. All right, so that's your first look at an ellipse that's not centered at the origin. All right, we had a whole bunch of shenanigans. We had to complete a square just to get to this point. Right? It took us a little while just to get here. All right, but after we completed the square, we could read A, B, and C. Well, we could read A and B. From there, we could calculate C, and then we could get all of our traits. All right, so with that, we're just going to keep on practicing. I'm going to give you some more equations or another equation of an ellipse, and then you're going to tell me all sorts of traits and graphic. All right, I will see you in a few, gang. Thanks so much. Bye.